Julian realized at this point that she had yet another dilemma. Like, she's definitely stuck on the why is there no blame? But at this point, it's like, why didn't you go to help your servant? There's no middle to this story. How does it end up that the guy's lying in the ditch and next we see him in heaven being rewarded? What happened? So she goes back to God, and I'm going to read this to you kind of in her uh, perturbed way, I'll say, as opposed to PO'd. Uh, why did you allow your son to suffer so much? How can you be a loving God who clothes us in your tender love and looks on us with compassion, which means you suffer with us, and yet you leave your beloved servant in the ditch? What's up, God? Like, can you explain this? And then she isn't, she's not, um, you know, testy about it. She's really like, there is no one else who can tell me. Please tell me the meaning of this. And she pleads with God, which, by the way, you do have this entire, uh, entire parable is one of your handouts. And it does start at the top explaining like how she's pleading with God. If I can't go to you for help, where can I go? Like, I need you to tell me. So, pardon me? It's called Chapter 50. Julian kept working, as we know, for 20 years on understanding what is going on here. And then the Lord said, remember, pay attention to all the details. Who's wearing what? What's the color? What are the expressions? And she did find a double significance in what the servant is wearing, that outwardly he's dressed as a common laborer, which she said, how is this proper that he's in the service of the king dressed in like this? And then when she really looked closely, she saw that his garment was all tattered on top of it. So um, it's like, what is going on? And so she saw that our Lord, in falling into the human body, was like falling into a tattered little tunic, or the sense of Adam, of us having our work to do. Um, but inwardly, so outwardly he's dressed as a common laborer, but inwardly she can see that there's a great love for the Lord or Master, which kind of mirrors the love that the Lord or Master holds for the servant. So next, here's the servant rushing to do the Lord's will. Now the servant's mission, as she realizes, as she meditates on it you know, longer, because remember I told you what's the middle of the story, that the servant actually has a task or mission for which he was sent. She knows that, that's part of the, part of the revelation, but what is the, Lord's, what is the servant's mission? There is a treasure which is hidden in the earth, which is desirous and loved by the master, by the Lord, which the servant is to bring back. And how can the servant do that? By being a gardener. He can till the soil. He can um, plow so that there's a, a, a rivulet of water to, to irrigate the, the, the plants. He can plant. And he can prepare this gift, this food that is highly desirous of the master and return it to him. Now, remember when I told you the story from John of the Cross about the story of, I'm going to give you a gift and it's your bride, and then Jesus says, I'm going to do better than that. I'm going to go lift up my bride, embrace her, and bring her to yourself. Well, that's what Julian realizes, again, a hundred years before John of the Cross, that it's Jesus' work as Jesus, the the historical Jesus, to suffer and labor for us, to bring us as that treasure that was such pleased, is so pleasing to the Father, and to restore that treasure into the Father's kingdom. So, um, and the servant is not to go back until he has prepared the food in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And now we have the fact that he fell really quickly into a ditch. And those who contemplate scenes of Jesus' passion and death often find themselves resisting the revelation that they desire. Because we look at this, again, it's the consummate evil. It's the worst evil that could be done, killing the Son of God. So often, like, people resist the revelation that they desire. But it's, Julian wants to make a point that it is consoling to us, 
And this is again a grace of centering prayer, to sit with Jesus in his passion, just to sit with Jesus and be present, and then allow what insight will arise to arise. But it's a consoling to our Lord that we would share, just like we would share in a friend's illness or pain just by sitting with him. That is a consolation. This is a gift from many of the mystics. It's a consolation to the Lord that we would just sit with the Lord in silence, just being with the Lord in his pain and his suffering. So this brings us back to a couple questions. Um, the third sense of scripture is what how should the listener respond? What does this tell us about our own behavior? So my two questions for you to consider quickly. What is the work that God has given you to do? Why are we here? It's we're all like one piece of a giant puzzle. Without that piece, the puzzle makes no sense. Without your piece, what is your work? Or what about, what if you want to talk about the master's attitude about the reward? If I could please call your attention back up to the screen. Um, I'd like to ask and anybody who wants to, especially that side of the room, to join in. Um, what is the work that the, what is the literal work that the servant in the parable must do? He must go out and dig and in, uh, um, plant and dig and work and garden and bring the treasure. But what is the work that we have to do? Would anybody like to suggest an answer? Yes. <laughs> so we have to spread the good news of the gospel. Honestly, like, how would you be living your life without the gospel? Okay, this is a superb answer. She said, acceptance of the moment, whether it's a good moment or not, is really the work we have to do. This could be an entire another day. <laughs> yeah, that is 100%. Anyone else? Also, I'd like to say something about the second question. What about the master's attitude regarding the reward? Well, my answer for that is that having patience, loving each other. I think love is very important. And loving each other and praying, which I do, and caring for the sick. And I think all oh, this is important, praying for your family, because prayers are so important, and so many people need our prayers. And I think that is the most important thing that he wants us to hear, that he wants to hear from us. Thank you. Christine, like, absolutely, like, you guys are prayers. She couldn't have said this more eloquently. Like, your task is really to pray. I'm telling you, the world's depending on you guys. I, I'm not joking. Is anyone else over there interested in sharing because the mic is over there? <laughs> okay, very succinctly put, God created us for himself and for each other. How about this table? The mic can find its way here. I, I, for me, it was to bear the pain and still know that we're loved by God. And if I wanted to jump over to the other table, it would be the good stuff, too. I mean, just be in the moment and know that we're loved always. Um, and then everybody else in here, we all talked about how sharing the good news was important. Great. Be silent and listen to him. Let him direct <laughs> To be the best version of ourself, which is the self that God made, then I think we can do our praying and spread our love and be the best person we can be. That leads to a good point. Um, part of our task is to be the best we can be because we do not want to cons you know, confuse unconditional love, 
complete willingness to forgive with unconditional approval. Like God does not approve of hatred or bigotry or resentment or anger. Well, anger is a good side and a bad side. God does not approve of bitterness. God does not approve of violence. God, so unconditional love and forgiveness un, and readiness to forgive is not unconditional approval. So part of what we have is our goal, is our task, is to really, like, she, like many people have said, is align our will with the will of God. Really to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and to form you step by step, day after day. It's not going to be 100% you know, transformation tomorrow. We also have the task to move from the image to likeness of God. Like, that's to move from the image to likeness, because we're created in the image, but we're asked to be more in the likeness. What does the likeness of Jesus look like? Loving, forgiving, compassion, humility, thank you. Yeah, meekness. Um, but also to recognize to likeness of God. Like, that's to move from the image to likeness because we're uh, perfect. Thank you for that transition right into and what is Jesus' task? It is to be what she just said, the human face of the invisible God. Jesus truly was. So spending time with the scriptures, with the gospels, we get to know the human face of the invisible God. So, and what else was Jesus' task? Reconciling the world to the Father. If you think the last thing that Jesus said on the cross is, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How's that for a model? Um, and also that Jesus went through his passion trusting in the Father, even when he felt completely abandoned. Um, this is a quotation, which again is long, but to me amazing. It's by Archbishop uh, Rowan Williams, who is a Julian scholar. When you are meditating on the crucifixion, when you're meditating on the passion of Jesus. It can be harrowing as we see all our illusions about God being destroyed. Jesus himself experiences God's powerlessness to preserve him from the horror of the cross. Our own often unconscious image of God as the one who saves the good from such a fate, who intervenes to strike down our enemies, is dashed. This experience, too, can be an opportunity for deepening of our friendship with God. We need to see the Father's weakness and powerlessness as the inevitable and necessary corollary of the son's powerlessness in a world of corrupt and enslaving power. God vanishes on the cross. The father and the son remain in the shared consubstantial weakness of their compassion. But the God who vanishes is the illusory God of those like Caiaphas and us, if we are honest, who believe in a God whose power is coercive and vengeful to opponents or sinners. This packs a lot of, in, a lot of thought in it. And what uh, Rowan Williams is saying is, we find it very harrowing, that's his term. We find it very disturbing, very, un, very unsettling to let go of our image of God. We prefer to have a God who's like a vending machine God, or a God who's going to reward us for all of our good behaviors and punish. That's not the God who allowed his son to suffer and die on the cross, which is not to say that God the Father sent Jesus to die on the cross, or that he sat up there like, OK, now I can love them again. That's ridiculous. But this is a God who allowed his son for our sake to suffer and die on the cross. The cloud of the knowing says, what the mind cannot absorb, the will embraces. 
The mind is the knowing faculty. The will, the heart, is the loving faculty. Beautiful. Thank you. So this still brings us to her dilemma, which is, uh, why is evil? Why is it permitted? Why is it necessary? Those are huge questions. And what is the reward? So we're going to look a fourth time uh, at Julian's parable, adapted from Julian's Way by Rita Mary Bradley. I just would like to kind of read this through with you, because we're getting to the end. So to, to start with, here we are. It invites you to pretend that you are sitting outside Julian's anchor hold. You are at her window. Julian realizes that the second person of the Trinity and Adam, which include all mankind, are united. As, as people have said, are united in an um, inseparable way. There is nothing that can separate us. When Adam fell, God's son fell in order to save Adam from death and from hell, even though the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, was equal to God in his divinity, he willingly took upon himself all human sinfulness with no regard for the pain he would suffer. Jesus took upon himself all human blame. Please look up at the screen. Jesus took upon himself all human blame, and thus God does not assign any more blame to sinners than he would have assigned to Jesus. This is Julian's final, final uh, revelation. God does not assign blame to us. God instead looks at us with compassion and pity. Christ's humanity includes all who will be saved by the incarnation and passion of Christ. And since God's Son and Adam are joined by an eternal union, they can never be separated. This is from the Diary of St. Faustina, for those of you who are familiar with her. I think it says the same thing, written in 20th century language. I saw a great radiance, and in the midst of it, God the Father. Between this radiance and the earth, between the radiance of God and the earth, I saw Jesus nailed to the cross in such a way that when God wanted to look at the earth, he had to look through the wounds of Jesus. I understood that it was for the sake of Jesus that God blesses the earth. So if you could just hold that image in your mind, this is also just what Julian said. When the Father looks at us, he only can look through his beloved Son. He only sees us through his Son. So consequently, he assigns no blame to us. He looks at us only with compassion. Which, again, is not to say that God loves us so much he wants to help us change and be transformed. That's a given. He wants us to be, you know, healed and restored and forgiven and, and, and made better. And, and, but God loves us and only looks at us through his son. Now, um, we have just enough time to read through this. I think that you'll enjoy it. And it would be more fun if I had a couple volunteers who are really like quick thinkers and can read these parts. So great, thanks for volunteering, Dan. And uh, Alice, or no, right here, come on down. Bring your paper up, please. Come on down. You know how there's the reading of the passion where one person takes a part and the other person takes a part? Okay. So your part is God, obviously, and your part is the um, narrator, and your part is Julian at the window of the anchor hold in the 16th showing which repeated, integrated, and expanded the visions that precede it, Julian continued to ask God how, in actuality, all things could be well. Since this is also our question, we can imagine how insistently she continued to press God to answer her. Picture yourself pausing at her anchor hold window, listening to the holy altercation, 
similar to what transpired between Job and the Lord. Julian wants to know, how can all things ever be well? God cites an impressive record. I made all things from nothing in the first place. Sin, as we have seen, is really nothing, so I can make well all that is not well. And God continues. I have already made well that first and greatest harm, the sin of Adam, and I want you to know that I will make well all that is less. But, Julian insists, this present situation requires the impossible to be made well. God answers gently. True, you cannot do the impossible, but I can. Hence, all things can be made well. Even if this assurance does not put Julian fully at ah, even this insurance does not put Julian fully at ease. For the tribulations then and to come are horrible. They include pain, ravaging disease, violence, hunger, rejection, church schism, separations, despair, death, the mystery of evil. And in the vision of the passion, is some in some way Julian had seen all this suffering. Julian may well ask of Christ and. In our name too. Really? What kind of mother are you? With the candor possible only with those we love. All is not well. None of these things are being made right, are they? To us, God sounds defensive. I didn't say that. I did not say you would not be tempested, nor do I say you will not be travailed. Then what did you say? God answers this time sharply and with a mighty voice. What I said is that you will not be overcome. What then is in Julian's way? Only when the final judgments are in will we no longer be stirred to say in any way to the Lord, Lord, if it has been thus and so, then all would have been well. At the end we shall say in one mighty chorus, Indeed, this, this is, is the way, way things are, are, and it, it is, is well. all well. Yes, and it is all well, for we shall then see truly that all, all things are done as it was ordained, ordained before, before anything, anything was, was made. made. Though tempested and travailed, we can have a mighty trust and lasting comfort. Why? Because God loves us and takes delight in us, and he wills that we, by nature and grace, love in return and take delight in this one who loves. And then all shall be well. We are to love ourselves in God and all that God loves for God. For, for, God, for, for God, love, has, for love has no beginning, and this love is God, and love has been created, and is our soul in God, and love is a gift enabling us to live with contrition, compassion, and a full-hearted longing for God. All this God means by love. This finally is Julian's way. Thank you. Wow. So they do deserve an applause. Um, I have one really quick question that illustrates this because I'm kind of a concrete person. Uh, James Finley said, told this story. Imagine that you're on a, on a ship and it's a party and it's at night and you're, everyone's playing, you know, everyone's enjoying themselves drinking and there's a band and all this and you're, you know, having, you're at a party and you fall overboard. Okay, you're, it's dark, it's in the night, you're out in the ocean, you've fallen in. And so you're calling out, help, somebody help me, I, you know, I've fallen out, but no one's paying any attention, they're all still, you know, enjoying their party, and so you are in the ocean calling out to God, God, send someone to help me, God, please help me, God, save me. What is going to happen? You are going to drown. And this is actually what, what God says to Julian. I didn't say that you would not be travailed. I did not say you would not be tempested. What I said is you will not be overcome. In the final analysis, you will not be overcome. You will not be separated from the God who created you for love. 
And that's the end of Julian's message. There is a, uh, an app on your phone or on your computer. It's called discerninghearts.com. It's really my favorite app at this point. It's amazing. Father Timothy Gallagher has amazing talks. And, but there is an interviewer called Krista McGregor. And her, if you look for it, it'll be inside the pages. And then she just posted really recently an interview with this Veronica Mary Rolf, which is uh, Veronica Mary Rolf is a Julian scholar. It's great. It is so worth your time if you're interested. So it's discerninghearts.com, and then you know they have one of those searching things. So you can look either for Krista McGregor, who is the interviewer, but the person who is the author and the Julian scholar is Veronica Mary Rolf. And the other thing is that gentleman, Robert Froyworth, uh, I'll write that down too, whose book is back there. If you went to YouTube and you put Robert Froyworth and put Julian of Norwich, his uh, teaching, which he gave at an Anglican church, is great. Just these are great. They're both Julian scholars and authors. So um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question about the anchors and anchorites. I do. It's pattymerlo.com, P-A-T-T-Y-M-E-R-L-O.com. And my husband just updated it about three days ago. So, And I have about eight workshops I give. Um, about the, Thank you for asking. Uh, the anchors, anchorites, it was quite common. There were several anchorises or anchorites in Norwich within the time of Julian's lifespan. So it, she was not all that unusual. And sometimes it would... I think it's kind of a spin-off because you know the early desert fathers, they had some of them were lived in community and then some of them. But with this anchorite and anchoress thing, normally it would be considered somebody who had lived in community first and then went out to be living alone as an anchor. I just want to thank her for coming. It was a Pleasure. wonderful, wonderful time to have you here. We enjoyed it all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're a wonderful, wonderful audience. Thank you so much.